Hello everyone, how are you doing today? It's really hot up here. I'm getting a sunburn on my bald head. So if you're cold, come snuggle up on stage. So people often ask you, what's your favorite time of the year in, in agriculture? And for me, it's always been seeding. Seeding is great because it's kind of a blank slate. Um, I hate harvest. I hate that it's dry and itchy and usually your expectations are never met. You have disappointing yields. Springtime, everything's fresh. You get to start new. And I always love studying how can we do a better job of seeding. So precision planters have been around for a long time in the row crop industry. And this is just an example of, of one. So planters have been used in corn and soybeans for, for many years. And they're really kind of a different system than the way we do our small grains in Western Canada. So what's really unique about them is, is how they distribute the seeds across the field, but there's also a whole lot more. So as we've been engaged in, in research, we actually bought a planter to look at dryland grain corn first and foremost. So I'm gonna go through a little bit about how planters are different from say our traditional air seeders, just so you have the basics in case you, you have no experience with planters. They have a different language. They talk in seeds per acre as opposed to bushels per acre or seeds per meter squared. So we'll try to, to talk about that in a language that makes sense. Um, in this case, this planter here, that's the seed. What's really neat about a planter is that the seed comes out exactly where the depth gauge is. So in our planters, depth control to me is, is one of the more important parts of the puzzle because we want a nice uniform crop. It's not just about how we're placing that seed, it's about how we're placing it horizontally and, and, and what kind of seed bed that we're doing. So one, I think the, one of the good advantages with a planter is that depth wheel is exactly where the seed comes out. So then you're gonna follow the contour of the land and do a really good job of putting that seed at a depth that you want to. In our case, a lot of people say, oh, well, planters suck because we can't put all of our fertilizer down. Well. I think that's a logistical barrier that can be overcome. In our case with the small planter, we just simply have a separate row unit to put the fertilizer down. In this case, it's a double disc opener and we just sideband our urea down about two inches to the side and about two inches deep. Um, in this case, that double disc in the, in the clay soils, they're actually throwing a lot of soil. So at one point we, we switched that and put a single single disc fluted uh, uh, opener and, and in that case it worked really well and it was very low disturbance but then we had these dry years and and actually didn't work as well so sometimes that disturbance is a good thing it helps loosen up the soil and allows a little bit of better seed to soil contact and I think allows the moisture to come up so as we're adapting these planters um, sometimes we'll find that certain things will work in certain circumstances and then conditions change and what you thought was a good idea was a bad idea. So we actually went back to the double disc and ran the trial for a whole other year. In the back, we can put our liquid phosphorus with the seed. So there's a seed firmer, and right behind that, it presses the seed into the soil, and we put uh, the 1034 or an alpine uh, uh, phosphorus fertilizer basically over top of the seed row, and then the closers come and close it all up. So slightly different scenario. In this case, you can get either a sprocket drive or you can have the electric over hydraulic um, situation. In plots, we chose to go with the, the sprocket drive because it reacts immediately. We, there's no time for it to speed up and slow down, but uh, a lot of the, the bigger units will come with the electric uh, versions, and then you can actually variable rate based on each individual opener. <clears throat> we talk about parallel linkages in, in zero till is, Literally, there's two linkages that are parallel, and I find often people use these terms that they don't understand what they mean. In this opener system, it's two linkages that are side by side, and then there's a little bit of physics there that will help have proper penetration with a disc opener. So it's kind of almost pushing that disc into the soil, which again helps with better seed control. And then there's springs there for down pressure. These drills or planters were really not designed for zero till, but as long as you have heavy enough springs and the proper residue managers that you saw in the last slide, I, we've found that you can go through pretty good residue. An alternative to that is doing something like strip tillage. So when they're planting corn, uh, instead of going completely zero till, they strip till in the fall. So that basically tills a narrow band and then they deep band some immobile fertilizers, things like phosphorus and potassium. 
That's where the vacuum plate is. So as opposed to an air seeder, a vacuum planter literally uses a vacuum and it sucks seeds onto metal plates, which you'll see in another slide there. But that's where it happens. It individually has holes for each seed and then places it down the seed row. That's that seed firmer that I was mentioning earlier. It's basically a big aluminum disc and it's flat, about half an inch wide. After the seed is placed down, that seed firmer pushes it down into the ground. So it's nice and flat, good, again, soil contact. And then those, uh, those cl um, roll cl closers will put a nice furrow over top of it. So everything is, in a sense, precisionly placed and, and does a really nice job. So this is a shot with, uh, with corn in there. So we talk about corn as really important as far as using planters are concerned. And the reason is, is that it competes with itself. So we're trying to create a scenario across the field where the seed is spatially distributed uh, as best as possible. And so that their goal is always to get basically one cob per plant. So we don't want to have too many uh, cobs. In our case, when we're looking at wheat, same idea. You'd want to have one main head and, and try to reduce the number of tillers. And they found that that is usually optimum. Funny thing is with corn though, we're talking about 30 to 40,000 seeds per acre. And in our studies, with the lower heat units that we have in southern Alberta, we've actually always found that the higher seeding rates and the narrower row spacing is important. Because our growing season is so fast, the objective is always, can we get canopy closure as fast as possible in a, in a perfect world by the June solstice when it's uh, the longest day of the year? Because we're in the business of capturing sunlight and whatever orientation we can do with plants that can maximize that, it, the better. So we're, we're basically trying to improve the solar panels. So this is a shot of the study that we did in dryland grain corn and we thought, oh well, um, we're going to need lower seeding rates. We found that actually the higher seeding rates perform better in dryland southern Alberta. Um, you can see in, in, in a spot there, there's, you can notice where one plant is missing. So it's just perfect distribution of plants. When we're moving to something like grains though, and remember I said 30 to 40,000 seeds per acre, when you're seeding a wheat crop at say two bushels an acre or three or 400 seeds per meter squared, we're now in that one to one and a half million seeds per acre. So it's kind of a different scenario when we talk about small grains versus a corn type scenario. Soybeans are more in that 200,000 seeds, so it's kind of a, a different thing. So here's soy, a, a shot of soybeans that was actually not with the planter. So then you can see that it's not even space between each plant. And in that world, this is what we're trying to avoid. Anyways, it was just a pretty picture I wanted to put up there. So we played with corn and we understand the principles and the concepts of a planter. And there's folks down here that have planters for their beans and their soybeans, or sorry, their beans and their sugar beets. So more and more farmers have been thinking, um, Let's, what about canola? And, and in, the reason that that's been a driver is it's hybrid seed production. So you've got this pricey seed and people are thinking, can I do a better job and maybe cut back on seed costs? I wanna tell you that that's not what we're trying to promote here. In fact, we're not trying to promote anything. We're just trying to do something different. We wanna push the envelope. That's kind of the concept of Farming Smarter is that you know, we wanna try different things and, and more often than not, we find out what fails. So, since farmers were already interested in trying this out, there was a study done by Neil Harker up in Lacombe where they actually looked at planters, but they did it on the wide road spacing, that 20 or 22 inch road spacing. And that really didn't make sense to us. So we noticed that in our corn study that we did better on 20 inch rows. So what if we took a planter and squeezed it up a little bit narrower? So we did canola on 12 inch row spacing. And that's, that's what it looks like on a seed plate. There's 120 holes on the plate for the monosem planter there, and it's individually placing one seed at a time. So we compared a 12 inch row spacing to a wider 20 inch row spacing, and we also compared it to our air drill on 12 inch row spacing. So Lewis is gonna talk about the actual results of that study, I'm kind of given the preamble for that. So after we've finished this um, canola study, this last year the Canadian Agricultural Partnership through the Alberta government funded a project where we could look at other crops. So now we're looking at Durham. So there's um, some farmers that came to me and said, you know what, we haven't been able to push Durham yield in 20 years. So we thought, well, why not look at planters? There's so many neat things about being able to improve yields 
in a planter scenario because now we've got a more even crop. And can we manage tillers? Can we manage fusarium head blight timing? The more even you, the crop you have, the better job you can do at spraying your fungicides, maybe your growth regulators and such. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's what it looks like with wheat on a plate. We thought we'd try it out on hemp because hemp has been a growing industry now. People are pretty excited about producing CBD and it's an expensive seed. So is there an advantage to planting hemp? We also did peas, all the pulses. Peas, chickpeas, lentils, soybeans, faba beans. And there's some soybeans on the plates. So we ended up getting a lot of plates for our planters. So that's one of the downsides is we have to change these plates every time we change the crops. Um, but the summer students didn't mind it. They had a lot of fun, right? So seeding was okay. Everybody was excited because seeding's fun. We, get, we like to get our trials in and, and do a good job. They weren't so happy when they had to count all of the plants. So hundreds and hundreds of uh, plant counts being done. And we couldn't do that without our crew and, and really appreciate the hard work that they did there. So a quick uh, shot, we've got five different seeding rates and I did put it into pounds per acre. This change is very dramatically based on seed size. But, um, so seeds per acre, we did 20, 40, 80, and 160. And that's kind of a geometric range and allows for good statistical power. Because when we do these studies, we try to design them in a way that will eliminate bias. And that's using the scientific process and using statistics to be able to say, are these differences real or are they based on other factors or their variability? So Lewis and I have been kind of racking our brains over the results and we've only got you know, one year on some of these studies, but at the same time, it, it is a difficult thing to deal with data and understand what level of confidence you have in the data. So we're gonna do like a little virtual plot tour here. You can ignore the me on the video and just focus on me here, because I'm here. But what this does, Don, was a plot shot on June 21st, looking at all of those canola treatments. And very, very striking visual differences on an irrigated study. So the plot that's right next to me there, that's, um, that's a full seeding rate with the air drill. So six, seven pounds per acre. Kind of didn't look too bad, but that's probably a higher seeding rate than most, of, most people are doing. So the next plot was with the air drill again, at probably a more common rate, three to four, maybe five pounds. You can see even at that rate, the distribution of seed, um, in our case, we were using a pillar laser opener in our, our air plot drill. It's already not perfect, but canola is so plastic, it does a really good job. So that's at two and a half pounds. We have little spots where it didn't come up. This spring was quite dry, so I think we had some seeds that were stranded in dry soil and then maybe came up. You look at the staging too, and that you'll have plants at different crop stages. So you could have a two leaf versus a four leaf and so on. So as we move down into really low seeding rates, you can see that the space between plants is, is really quite sporadic and, and not really where you'd want to. So here, this is a reseed scenario, really not what you're looking for. So think of that now when we move down into the planter and we'll show you the, the difference that the planter makes. So now we're into a 20 inch row spacing. Now immediately it looks prettier, but at the same time there's really big gaps in between those rows. So if you're trying to look at canopy closure, we found that on those wide row spacing, canola never really does get to a point where it, it closes up entirely through the growing season. So there's more seeds per row, so they kind of look prettier, but they're all even, they're all at the same growth stage. Um, I'm not a big fan of the wide row spacing when it comes to the planters, and that's why. As we move down on the seeding rates, they still look, I guess, a lot prettier. Looks aren't always everything. As we'll see in the results from Lewis, the yields don't always translate. So now we're down to two and a half and we're still looking pretty nice. Um, we'll talk to the folks in Australia and they're going on 30 inch row spacing at about a pound to a pound and a half per acre. But they've got a totally different growing season and, and the plants have more time to branch out. There are studies that have proven that in canola, um, the distribution of seed, uh, the better it is, the higher yielding the plant is. It'll branch out, it'll do more. So we already know that. Can we achieve that through a planter? I think we can. I'm not convinced in our growing season that we can do it on this row spacing. So now we move over to the air drill or the planter on, on 12 inch. What do you think? Is that canopy closure there? 
So visually, you can see right off the bat that that's, that's the difference it makes. So any little edge that we get, as long as the rest of the growing season continues to not limit the yield, then I think we're in a good scenario. So yeah, that's a high seeding rate, but we've achieved what we were trying to do. We want that canopy closure by the June solstice. Now we get into a more reasonable uh, seeding rate at 3.3, not quite canopy closure, but pretty darn close. So you can see that at that point, that that's the canopy architecture that we're looking for. What's interesting though too, is that it doesn't change much as we get back lower seeding rates. So here we're down to two and a half pounds and it's still looking pretty nice. At the lowest seeding rates, now we're at 1.7. Generally, we're finding that the yield curve with the planter on narrow rows, it's pretty flat. As you go to about one, one and a half pounds, it doesn't really rise much beyond that. And in fact, in some cases in dry land, we'll see a yield reduction at that high seed rate because we're just overcrowding the rows. And then here we're at 0.8 pounds per acre. So this is, this is a ridiculously low seeding rate. And you know, the canopy closure just isn't there either. So I think even with the planter, that's pushing the boundaries as far as what we can do. So that gives you a good visual look of the types of things we've been seeing within this study. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Lewis now to talk about the actual data. So yeah, Ken, Ken gave us a pretty good, uh, pretty good outline of what our, our canola research showed us. And a lot of what I'll go over here is going to really um, kind of dig deeper into that, that video that, that he just covered. So over the last uh, four years now, we've been looking at planters, um, row crop planters for canola. So we've looked at an air drill, a planter on 12 inches, and, and a planter on 20 inch row spacings. And we've done them both in, in, in dry land and, and irrigated environments. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna walk you through the trial, um, kind of from emergence to yield, and, and give you some visuals along the way, show you what we saw um, as far as uh, performance for, for each of these three seeders. So to, be, to, to begin with emergence, um, well, even, even before that, the big, the big advantage with the planter is the seed placement. So it's putting seed in the ground at uniform spacing, um, so the spatial distribution is, is better than with an air drill, and it's also placing those seeds at a uniform depth. And right off the bat, we, we see an advantage of that. So I've got a lower seed rate on the top three slides, top three pictures, and a higher seed rate at the bottom. And we've got the 12-inch planter on the left there, uh, the 20 inch in the middle and, and the air drill on the right. And, and right away, if, if you take a look at that air drill on the right, you can see that the, the seed spacing's a little more erratic. So we don't have that uniform uh, spatial distribution of seed. Um, in addition to that, the staging is a little more variable as well. So we've got some bigger plants and some smaller plants. And, and when you get that variability, you get a little bit more competition. You've got some bigger plants that are gonna start to compete and, and maybe overtake um, shadow and overtake some resources from the smaller plants. Um, the monosem on the, the, the planter on the 20 inch rows, you, you can see it looks really nice and, and Ken sort of alluded to this before. There's, there's actually a lot of seed, especially on those higher rates, packed into those rows. So in order to hit uh, a target rate for a field, we really have to pack those, those inputs in, 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 in each row when the rows are wider. And, and what that does, um, instead of helping the seeds, it, it actually creates a, a more competitive environment. So they're, they're competing with each other a lot sooner than they would on narrow rows. And we see, we see some disadvantage of, of this throughout the season. This chart here is showing um, our plant stand. So, so we're talking about five weeks in, how many plants do we have um, versus the seed rate. So, so along the seed rate, <clears throat> as the seed rate increases. And we can see that in, in the blue, the, the 12 inch planter looks really good. We've got a much, much better plant stand there on that 12 inch planter. And, and what really jumps out is actually that 20 inch planter. You know, we don't get, we get less plants coming up with that 20 inch uh, row spacing than we would with that 12. And, and that was, um, that's a big part of the story because a, a lot of times when we're using planters for canola, we're doing it sort of a direct adaptation from a, a bean planter or maybe a sugar beet planter on 20, 22 inch rows. But this is showing that there, there really is a benefit to tightening up those rows and getting maybe a more uniform distribution of, of plants in there. Uh, this is on dry land, pretty much the same, same scenario. That, that planter on 12 inches is really outperforming from an emergence and from a plant stand um, standpoint. 
Now we're looking at kind of getting into early June, so maybe a couple of weeks before solstice. Um, on the low rates, again, if you look at the air seeder on the low rate, you've got pretty, pretty erratic seed placement, plant placement, and, and some variability in staging. Whereas on the, on the planter, on, on both 12s and 20s, looks really nice. You've got uniform plant stands, um, but there's a pretty big gap in there uh, on that 20 inch planter. So that's something to sort of keep in mind. And on the higher rate, so it's, it, I mean, three and a half pounds an acre, it's not that high, but as we increase the seed rate, it sort of helps the, the air drill compete a little bit better. So that's sort of our forgiveness if something goes wrong, is, is to increase the seed rate and it gives us a little bit of space. So here's a, a pretty big jump forward. Now we're looking at flower. And again, with that lower seed rate, that, that 12 inch planter looks really nice. Um, everything's filled out, pretty uniform flower. The planter on 20 inches, um, it doesn't, you can, you can still see the, the row spacing in there. So you can see that gap between plants. So that's sort of an indication that we're not really filling out and taking full advantage of the resources, the sunlight, the moisture, the nutrients in there. Um, and, it, and we'll see that again in yield, that that's, that's to the detriment of that 20 inch planter. And then the air seeder, especially on that low rate, there's a lot of variability in flower. So all the plants, there's some that are getting into flower, some that are in full flower. So, that, so we don't quite have that, that uniformity there still. And again, on the higher rates, that, that 20 inch planter really fills out. It's looking a lot better. And the, and the air drill looks, looks a little bit better, but still not quite as good as, as the planter did. So I, I, I put this slide in because I, I think it sort of illustrates, um, I guess, what happens when we don't get moisture. And one of the big advantages with the planter um, is that what it does is it places seeds equally distant from each other and helps to mitigate competition. So it reduces the interplant competition. The canola plants aren't competing with each other and it gives each plant an equal opportunity to grow. But what happens in, in a, um, you know, a yield restrictive environment when, when moisture is, um, when there's a big lack of moisture, and in this case, you know, we've got drought conditions. Um, you can see that there's, other than seeing the rows, there's not really a big difference between treatments here. And what happens is when the plants don't have enough resources to get big enough to compete with one another, we really don't see that same advantage with the planter. So across our study, you know, 12 trials over four years, we did see quite a bit of variability in, uh, um, in results depending on location, depending on weather, um, and that kind of thing. So, so it's really where... Just speak a little louder, they're having trouble with the mic. Okay. So it, it's really in situations where, um, where the environment is conducive to competition between plants that the planter really offers a benefit. So here's our, our yield results on the, on the dry land sites. And the first thing that pops out is that 20 inch planter. Um, it's an added uh, over eight sites. It, it's almost universally at a disadvantage, so it's yielding a lot poorer than everything else, and that's tied to that factor of a lot of seeds packed into those seed rows and a high level of competition. So, so they're out competing each other for resources to the detriment of, of yield. And the next thing that that really pops out is that the planter on 12 inches is, is performing better than the air drill, um, and and this is an average of eight sites. And if we dig into each site. Um, you know, trial by trial, what we had was, was three out of eight times that 12 inch planter outperformed everything else. And then four out of eight times the air drill and the 12 inch planter were pretty much the same as one another. So, so what we're seeing is, is the planter is, it's competitive. It's as good or better than the air drill in almost every situation that, that we looked at it. And, and in fact, given the right conditions, uh, the planter can really boost performance. Now, once we get into an irrigated environment, sort of a, a, a higher yielding scenario, um, that tw 20 inch planter really starts to suffer. So again, you know, there, there's, there's ample resources, ample moisture, and a lot more competition between those, between those plants. And, and not only are they competing with each other within the row, but they're really struggling to fill out that, that 20 inch space between rows. So that, that, those kind of competing factors of, of higher competition and maybe a later canopy closure is really adversely affecting yield for the, for the 20 inch planter. And then we see again the 12 inch planter is, is performing quite a bit better and, and we saw a much bigger yield difference on the dry land or on the irrigated environment for the 12 inch planter than for the air drill. And it's a little bit tough to see with the regression lines on here, 
but uh, but that that difference was more pronounced on those lower seed rates, so that 40 to 60 seeds per meter squared, which, which is roughly two to four pounds an acre. Because again, as we increase the seed rates, um, the air drill is a little bit more competitive. So when we take everything together, 12 sites across dry land and irrigation, we had about a 10 bushel yield increase in that 20 to 40 seeds, or 40 to 60 seeds per meter squared, so two to four pounds an acre. Uh, and once we went up to, you know, that the, the five, seven pounds an acre, we we're only looking at, at an average of, of two or three bushel an acre increase. So those lower seed rates, the, the planter, particularly on 12 inches, is, is really helping us do a better job of, of growing canola. And this diagram, it really kind of summarizes this whole idea of competition. You can see that the seed placement for the for the 12 inch planter is is much more uniform. So there's um, every plant has a really good opportunity to grow before it starts competing with other plants. And, and it sort of makes us think about, you know, what the next step is. And, and, you know, with a more equal distribution of seed, I think there's real potential to, to really capitalize on, on seed spacing and, and to try to push, uh, push some yield boundaries. So, um, so that's that for the canola results. And, and Ken's going to come and talk a little bit about uh, some of our work with pulses this year. Thanks, Lewis. So, so this was kind of fun to be able to try something that nobody's really ever done before, um, to, to squeeze it to 12 inch row spacing and, and to look at different crops. So what I found this spring was I, I really enjoyed going out and looking at the plots. Um, the, everything that we did with the planter really did excel over the air drill. So we had these scenarios where, you know, you could, it looked like greenhouse type crops where it was one plant after the other. It was very precise and mechanical. In this case, they're getting destroyed by peat leaf weevil, but whatever. Um, and a lot of really visually striking differences. And, and that's one thing I know it was kind of a, it wasn't kind of, it was a crappy year. It was drier than hell. And um, we didn't get to see the end results of, of the potential that we put forward this spring. So in, in this case, the, the, the majority of the, the yield results were a wash because we barely had any yield at all. So, so that's the downside. These were all dry land locations. We did three of them across southern Alberta and all those different, different pulse crops. So everything came up nice and then, you know, we had hot temperatures in the spring. It baked the soil. But one thing I can say in a drought year, it's a really good year to learn. Every mistake you make, you're going to see it. So good time to be out scouting your fields more than ever in drought conditions. That's one thing that's fun in the research world. You can really see all the mistakes that you make, and I think that's how you learn. In a, in a good year, a good rain at the right time will make everything look good. Um, we were talking uh, with our friends over at Pillar Laser there that the importance of setting drills uh, it really shows up in a dry year. So who's done a good job and got out and set their drills properly made a big difference this year. So uh, keep that in mind, you know, despite the fact that it was a trying tough year and crappy yields, we, it's a really good opportunity to learn. Every little agronomic um, mistake will show up and, and you'll see that in some of the pictures here. So we're going to start off with our, our peas. Peas actually came up pretty decently for um, considering the conditions in Lethbridge here, we were we were incredibly dry. We've got a pretty heavy clay soil, it, and, and when it gets hot, it just bakes. So um, I think a lot of times we had seed stranded. So this study, we just put it all, everything on 12-inch rows. It's very basic. We cut the seeding rate, so we did half seeding rate versus a full seeding rate. In this case, it was 50 seeds per meter squared versus 100. So literally double. Um, you can see that there's a spot there in the middle where there's nothing that came up. That must be a tire track from last year. So again, what I'm mentioning is you'll see compaction in, in parts of your field where, you're, where you normally wouldn't in, in these types of years. But with the planter, even those tire tracks, there's plants that came up there. So that's the, that's the planter on the half seeding rate. Um, you can visually see that it's, it's almost as good or better than the air drill at the full seeding rate. So, so I thought that was pretty interesting. What I do love is that ability to follow the contours. And you'll see that even in like pivot tracks. It'll go down in the pivot track and there's a plant coming up, whereas uh, other types of openers don't have that same ability. And there's a planter at our full rate. So really nice looking crops. We even noticed that there's differences in growth stage that, that the, uh, the planters were more advanced and more uniform. So that, that kind of got us excited. 
I, I really enjoyed going out and looking at these, these pretty, pretty plots until they weren't so pretty. So chickpeas. Chickpea is a big seed. Uh, it needs a lot of moisture to germinate and we probably didn't set our air drill as good as we could have. So I think it's, it's probably disproportionately unfair on the air drill this, this time. Just like anything, we, we have to really take time to set those drills properly given the conditions that are going on. So really sparse population coming up there, even at the full rate, uh, and, and that's still a little low on the full rate. At, at times when you're using the planter and discs, it's tough to hit the high seeding rates that we need to. So, for example, wheat, where we like to get high, the highest I could get was 300 seeds per meter squared. In this case, you know, we just didn't do well, but for whatever reason, the planter uh, really shone on the chickpeas. So that's at the half rate, but then at the full rate, you actually have a crop. So the difference in this year could be between a crop or not, except that the, the, the rain never came and we basically didn't get a crop anywhere. So striking visual differences. Faba beans, a lot of people thought faba beans are just too big of a seed to even use in a planter. This is the air drill you can see again, spotty. Um, I think we had stranded seed in, in, in poor moisture regimes. Higher seeding rate definitely made a difference there. Still patchy, but when you move to the planter, it's perfect. So you can see, I'm turning the lights out. <coughs> At the full rate, you know, they just look beautiful. So I loved my crop tours. I was excited about the trial. Um, again, every, every type of crop. Lentils actually look pretty decent with the drill. As we move up on the seed rate, reasonable, but there's areas where there's misses, where, where there's no plants at all. So whenever you have that spot, usually what happens, kosha starts growing there. We have lots of issues with that, especially given uh, our issues with glyphosate tolerant kosha. When you move to the planter, we've got a plant stand everywhere. And I, I think that we always underestimate. How many of you guys think that uh, you noticed how important crop competition was to weed control this year? Anybody notice that? Yeah, pretty freaking horrible. It looks like kosher has taken over all of southern Alberta. With the planter at full rate, then we've got a pretty nice even stand. So to get into some of the results, on the emergent side, I mean, it, you could see visually that, that we did better with the planter. Statistically, um, in almost in all locations, we definitely got a, a better plant stand. That's wonderful. On all situations, the challenge was when it came to yield, everything was the same. So it was a, it was a really yo, low yield environment. We didn't have the, the yield potential for that to make a difference. So it was a wash this year, but keep in mind, this is three locations under drought conditions, and it's one year. When we do these types of studies, we usually like to shoot for a minimum of eight to nine site year locations to have confidence. Um, Lewis and I have been, like I said, racking our brain over this, that you know, one year we'll see one result, the next year we'll see a totally different result. How do we present it all? I mean, the variability that's out there is huge. I think that what we gotta look for is the concepts and, and where they make sense, and this is, I think agriculture is really the business of risk management. So if we had had a higher yielding environment, I'm pretty sure we would have seen some interesting results. So I'm um, looking forward to future years of study on this to find out. I mean, this is really basic, just a stab to, to look at it, but I'm personally more interested in can we advance our agronomy based on all of the different uh, conditions that this will allow for. So on to the not so wacky tobacco. This is the hemp. Hemp has been a craze. This is like the Wild West these days. Um, we had phone calls from so many different startup companies wanting to do hemp research. It was actually kind of terrifying. I mean, everybody left the oil field business and started wanting to grow hemp. Never even been on a farm before. Um, but we've been working on hemp for about seven years now and not a lot of research done in hemp, to be honest with you, and not too much, definitely not very much work done in planters. So we were curious, it's a high value crop. Um, these ones looked absolutely beautiful too. So uh, again, loved going on the crop tours. The hemp planter plots always look better. And Mike, Mike, um, Mike used the air drill, so he was sort of feeling bad because every time we went on a plot tour, his air drill plots always looked like crap compared to the planters. So, you know, a little bit of ownership there. 
Interestingly enough, again, while we saw this visual difference, and this was only one location under irrigation, we saw uh, definitely an, um, an advantage on the plant emergence, but it didn't necessarily translate into yield. So again, what looks pretty doesn't always uh, pay the bills. So visually there, you can see Morton did some nice videos. It was always that big difference, big difference in plant staging uh, as well as, as emergence. So we, we did see a, a pretty big advantage, especially on the higher seeding rate. When we're, when we're doing um, hemp, it's usually in that 200 seeds or 20 pounds per acre, depending on the seed size, is standard. Um, but a lot of people don't want to scrimp too much. Um, so, so definitely a difference in emergence. The general trend is the higher seeding rate, the lower the emergence. And that's, that's one thing we tend to forget about because it simply competes with itself. When we went to yield, literally no difference in yield, no statistical difference in yield. So, so Mike, uh, Mike, even though he was feeling bad in our plot tours, he can, you know, he can stand tall today knowing that the air drill did a pretty good job on him. We also did a liquid phosphorus study because there's not a lot of information known on seed placed phosphorus. And this is one that I've been really quite interested in because we also did that study in canola. And in our locations in southern Alberta, at least both Lethbridge, Medicine Hat kind of area, um, the recommendations for seed placed phosphorus are really quite low. And, and I think that phosphorus is often one of the yield limiting factors that we have in production. So in this case, we were told it's very sensitive to seed placed phosphorus. Um, on this chart, you can see we did see an emergence reduction, but not until we hit 60 kgs per hectare. It's pretty much the same as pounds per acre of actual phosphorus. That's the liquid that I, that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation that's dribbled on on the seed row. So no, um, no major effect up to 40 kgs, which is a lot of phosphorus to put with the seed. But when we went to yield, again, no statistical difference, even though there's, there's a numeric response you can see at the 40 kg per hectare rate. So I think both canola we noticed under high production environments and hemp is probably no different. We need to be looking at ways to push our phosphorus limits. We also did some, some split emergence on the right there. That's the 10, 10 with the seed and 10 dribble band and 10 and 50. Um, no advantage over any of the other rates. Uh, but that's a lot what people are interested in doing, fertigating or dribble banding on for a fertilizer later. So I'm going to finish up on the Durham, Durham project. And this is irrigated sites, three locations across southern Alberta. And, and we're comparing the planter on 12-inch row spacing to the air drill. And, you know, it does a nice job. You can visually see that uh, you've got uniform seed distribution along the row. Uh, you can't notice the spacing as much because you're putting down a million seeds per acre or 600,000 seeds per acre. So that, that gap that you see between corn or other plants just isn't quite as noticeable. <clears throat> but still visually different. So if you compare the planter here to the air drill, you've got different growth stages, you've got different uniformity. Now I'm quite interested, so everything that we're doing in a high production Durham environment can we say do a better job with our growth regulators because we need to time that staging properly and if you don't you actually hurt the crop can you do a better job controlling fusarium head blight because now all the crops are flowering at the same time if you have less tillering and 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 you can manage that then maybe you can do a better job at nailing your fungicide treatments but when you talk to mike too my cardian pathologist it could be the reverse. If everything's flowering right when the inoculum's there, maybe that's a bad scenario. So we want to get a feeling for, for, for that type of situation. We definitely saw a statistical response and improved emergence with the planter. So basically what we're saying is we're getting more seeds to germinate and survive with that level of precision. That doesn't mean we can't do a better job with other drills. Uh, that's just comparing these two in this scenario. When we move on to the yield, uh, quite variable. So our studies were variable this year. We didn't have the statistical power to say with, every, um, with a, a real level of confidence other than the top two treatments were better than the lowest treatment. And it doesn't really mean anything. What I'm interested in though is that the spread between the yields was about 97 bushels up to 120. So if we can reproduce these studies and find that there is a scenario or a combination of practices that we can actually improve those yields, you know, that, that's gonna be a yield advantage that pays. And, and if Durham actually continues 
I mean, when I grew Durham, I sold it when it was at the lowest point in the market. Thanks, Mike Jubinville, for helping me out there. Uh, now it's actually pretty reasonable, eight or nine dollars a bushel. Th those little differences can make a big difference um, in, in your bottom line. So look forward to continuing this study. We don't have all the answers, but I am excited about uh, some of the potential uh, for both advanced agronomy and just doing a better job seeding because seeding is fun. Question is: Is uh, your precision uh, is your drill a precision drill? So the definition. Do you mind turning my mic back on? There we go. The question was, was a, our plot seeder considered a precision drill? I think rhetoric, um, it's not precision to the same level that a planter is. So we have a, it's basically an air drill metering system and, and it's delivered with a regular opener. So I don't consider that precision. Whereas the vacuum planter is individually taking one seat at a time and placing it. So there is, there is rhetoric out in the industry of what's a precision drill and what isn't. Um, I think I don't have the answers to that, but it's definitely not to the same level that a planter is. Ken, Lewis, what, what is available in, in the marketplace now when we start looking at, are there machines you can use them for 20 inch spacing for corn and then turn around and change them to 12 inch to do pulse crops or canola with, or is that level of, uh, of uh, versatility not really available in the commercial market at this point. Any comments that? on that? Yeah, um, Can you turn Lewis's on now? Hello? Yeah, yeah so I'll kind of get into that here a little bit too, but um, you know, so that there are uh, a number of, say, 30 inch row planters out there that you can lift up every other row so, so it easily transfers from a 30 to a uh, um, to a 15, so that, that's kind of the quickest way to go. Um, and, and a lot of them, they're independently mounted on the toolbar, so they are movable. I don't know how much you would do that in season, but uh, yeah, so there are some options out there. Um, but for the most part, most of the planters out there are on those wider 20, 22, or 30 inch rows, um, and, and mostly being used for, for, say, beans or sugar beets kind of thing, so. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good segue in, in, into the, to the final part of the presentation here. Um, so this last year we did some work. Um, we took the results of our, of our small plot canola trials and we wanted to evaluate you know, how these planters worked uh, in a field environment um, because things do change and, and, and there is some, some adaptation and development work to be done on, on the planters to sort of have them work effectively at a field scale. Um, one of the things, you know, we've got a small four row planter, um, hills and contours in, in the ground aren't really gonna affect us the same way it might for, for something that's 40 or 50 feet wide. Uh, so here's, here's one fellow that we worked with and, and he, had, he had bought an old corn planter and, and outfitted it for canola, spent, spent the whole winter doing it. And, and it, was a, it was a pretty good learning experience for him and there was a lot of um, adjustments and work that had to be done. So, so one thing um, to point out was the discs for this particular planter are plastic rather than the metal discs that we would use in our monosem vacuum planter. And it's tough to see in the picture, but everybody has really black hands. And that's because we're adding graphite powder to the canola, a little bit of graphite. And what that does is reduces any sort of static buildup. So without that graphite powder and the plastic discs, those small canola seeds get hung up um, throughout the process and it reduces the, uh, the efficacy of the planter. Um, another hiccup with this particular planter is you can see there's, there's that seed tank on the back there and, and what it's supposed to do is feed seeds to each of the individual bays. But with the smaller canola seed, um, it just wasn't working properly. So, so every so many acres they had to stop and, and sort of you know, put, put a liter or two of seed in each of those bays. So, so these are just a, a couple of the small things that sort of need to be worked on and developed uh, as far as using planters sort of larger scale for some of these small grain crops. Um, but really, really quite happy with the performance. And, and one of the first things we wanted to, to identify was, you know, does it perform, um, you know, in, in an open world environment the same way we saw in the small plots. And, and um, you can see the seed placement was just as effective as, as we would have seen in our small plot. So that was a real plus. And the depth was, was uniform. So that side of things um, was a real win. Uh, for, for, for actually both the planters we use. So in this case, we have a, a monosem planter, and, and here we are you know, adjusting the depth on each individual bay, um, getting ready to seed in a different field. 
So one of the other dynamics with the planters is, and, and Ken had alluded to this a little bit before, is, is the fertilizer application piece. Uh, so most of these planters, in, certainly in my experience, aren't equipped to put down fertilizer with seed. So um, if you're in an irrigated uh, uh, scenario, it's maybe a little easier to manage that because there's not as much risk with, say, broadcasting, or maybe you would incorporate ahead of time. But in a dry land field, um, that fertilizer piece is going to be a critical component to figure out before, um, you know, adopting planters for, for small grains, uh, uh, you know, a little more often. So um, another piece, <coughs> excuse me, another piece with the canola is, is seed size. And, and I don't have any data, but anecdotally, um, it's been suggested to, to consider using a seed with a larger kernel weight um, so, so that it, you don't get, um, you know, the smaller ones might not stick in those holes as easy on those plates. Um, and then how well the seed treatment stays on. So if the seed tra treatment is cracking off and you're getting little bits of dust, little flakes of seed treatments, um, that again is going to impair the performance of, of that planter. So, so again, there's a lot of things um, at play and we just really wanted to go in and, and see, you know, how well does it compare. So we, we looked at some of our, our, our more promising treatments. So we looked at the planter on, in this case, 15 inches rather than 12 because that's, that's just what's out in the marketplace right now. And we looked at a, a low seed rate of two pounds an acre and then a higher rate at four pounds an acre. So we compared an air drill and a seeder in, in three separate fields um, this season. So it was challenging, certainly, to, to get two seeders out at the same day, same location, and, and you know, kind of managing, directing traffic and get everything put down well. But uh, everything went, went pretty good from that, that standpoint. Um, so here's, here's our emergence pictures from uh, dry land sort of zero till uh, environment and this was one of the one of the big questions with the planter is how well does it perform in that zero till environment um, you know the the row cleaners and, and residue management you know does that work as well as, a, as an air drill um, and and the the emergence was was pretty comparable I, I think on the low rate we saw a bit of an advantage for the planter and then on that higher rate uh, pretty comparable and and then this this cedar was a was a disc drill that actually performed quite well for, for the environment um, and dry conditions that, that we seeded in. So, so that was uh, uh, really nice to see that the, the, two, um, the two machines were, were quite comparable from an emergent standpoint. So taking a pretty big leap forward here, now we're looking into that, that flower. And on the left we have the seeder, on the right um, the, the, the planter. And you can see that the top right picture there that's the planter on that low seed rate. And there, there's, there's a, a one, one, one row miss there. But outside of that, you, know, you can see that the, plot, the, the plants are a little bit thinner. Um, and that's sort of that, that row spacing factor. So in this case, we had a pretty dry year. Uh, uh, this, this canola crop actually looks pretty good given the conditions. There was very little rain, but what rain we had happened to fall at the right time. So we had some timely rains throughout the season. And, and the producer we worked with was actually quite happy with, with the stand that was there. But again, when you have that moisture limiting condition, um, it, it sort of, it, it restricts, there's not that opportunity for those plants to really fill out in those row spacings. So, um, so you, can see, you can obviously see that here in the dry land. Um, on the higher seed rate at the bottom, you can still see that difference. You can identify the row spacing. You know, the, the flower doesn't look quite as full, but, but you don't see the difference as much. So the higher seed rate sort of protects us a little bit. But now in our, our irrigated site, um, you can hardly tell the difference. Uh, you really had to know, you know, where each strip was to be able to identify what treatment was there. And, and in fact, the planter probably looks a little better, a little bit more uniform flowering. Everything's at the same stage. So th it, it sort of speaks to that idea that every environment is a little bit different. You know, different soil types, um, different weather conditions, uh, different openers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I, I don't know how well you can see this uh, out there, but this is an aerial picture of the dry land site, and, and it's pretty obvious where the planter went. So we're sort of seeing the same thing. Those, those rows are pretty obvious in that moisture um, restrictive environment. Whereas in the irrigated location, if you didn't know where each treatment was, you wouldn't be able to find them, certainly not from this image. Um, so, you know, with the moisture, things kind of filled out and, and um, filled in those, they got that canopy closure a little bit better where there was ample moisture. So after we put all this effort in and, and got these, these trials planted, uh, Mother Nature threw us a bit of a curveball. We had one heck of a hailstorm 
um, that hit two of the fields that, uh, that we planted this year. So this one here was, was assessed at about 70% damage. And then we had an, the irrigated site also had 30% damage. So, so it kind of puts a damper on some of the results we had. Uh, uh, from a yield standpoint, it, it's, you know, it's any of the nuance that might have been there in, in, in differences was probably washed out by the hailstorm. Um, but certainly we were excited to see um, some of the, that, that the, the planter did perform competitively. So here's, here's the yield on the dry land site, and these are, so we're looking at 12, 12, 13 bushel yields, and, and, and essentially no difference across treatments. There's a little bit of variability, but statistically it, it doesn't bear out that there's really, we can expect to see any sort of difference. Uh, but again, keep in mind that, that any sort of nuance in that data was probably washed out by the, by the hail effect. Um, and, and the irrigated site, even more consistent. So everything's just under 60 bushels across the board. You know, 30% hail damage, so tough to say what that really means. But, but again, although that's disappointing to have the hail, we're, we're optimistic to see that, you know, from the, the emergence establishment flower that, that we did see those benefits and, and those advantages that we expected to see with the planter. So it did perform competitively with, with the air drill in, in a few different environments. Uh, so certainly, um, certainly excited to get going on, on next year's trials. We'll, we'll be doing this for another couple of years, and, and if Mother Nature cooperates, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see something a little bit more interesting on the yield front. So just to kind of wrap things up, um, really we're excited about the potential for planters. And, and what we've shown, certainly on the field scale side, is, is that they're a competitive option. And, and every site is going to be a little bit different. Every year is going to be a little bit different. But from what we've seen, that the, the planter is a competitive option. And you know, in most cases, it, 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 it does as good or better than the air drill. So that, that's, that's really promising. And I, I think there's an opportunity for a planter to be you know, a more integrated, a part of a more integrated seeding system that, that it's, you know, one of the tools in your arsenal as a producer to, to pull out that planter and, and, and use that for more than just, uh, uh, you know, conventional row crops. Um, also excited about the possibility to, to push some yield boundaries and, and thinking about that competition piece, you know, that the planter really restricts competition among plants. Well, when we're in a high yielding environment and we're really trying to push those yields, we're, we're putting, you know, we're throwing fertilizer or, or growth regulators or fungicide, you know, at, at plants. And this is what we're looking at with the Durham trial. That planter gives that plant, each plant, the opportunity to, to take full advantage of all those, um, all those benefits we throw at it before they start competing with each other. So, so I think there's, there's, there's the possibility for, for seed placement uh, to help us to, to better capitalize on some of the inputs we're putting into crops. Um, so, so that's something I'm really excited about with, with some of our, our planter projects moving forward. So, yeah, with that, um, thanks so much. Thanks very much, guys. Any questions out there? And there's mics at the back, which make it easier. You're close enough. I'll just bring you the mic. Well, I'm, that's really cool stuff, Lewis. So I have a question. In Europe, I understand that uh, small grains like the wheat are often seeded on a five-inch row spacing. So I have a double-barreled question. Your narrowest row spacing on the planter was 10-inch or 12-inch. And uh, maybe if you're going into high-yield research, would you maybe consider plots where you double-seeded and could do a five-inch row spacing for high-yield small grains? I, I think that's well worth looking into. And, and that diagram I had showed before with the, the, the um, honeycomb pattern, I mean, I think that's the direction we want to go is to sort of tighten up those rows even more. Um, so in our case, on our planter, we didn't really have enough space on that toolbar to pack in, you know, any other bays, but maybe a paired row would be an option that would give us, you know, the two rows side by side, help us to fill in that. You know, it's about getting that canopy closure and, and taking full, full advantage of, of that, that space, you know, the sunlight, the moisture there. So absolutely, I, that, that's, that's where I think we need to be, um, you know, thinking about pushing is tighter row spacings and, and getting that, you know, that even distribution of seeds because I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll bring you in the mic. The mortality on your uh, air drills, 
Uh, do you have any specific factor that you think was the main, other than the dryness? Was it variability in depth or? Yeah, I, I, I think that was certainly a factor, was the depth. So, so with, with, with the air drill, you end up getting some, uh, some seeds that are going to be a little deeper, some that might get, you know, shall, uh, uh, um, stuck sort of above the moisture because you don't have that depth control. So I, I, I certainly think the depth is a factor. If you're not making it into moisture, getting that seed to soil contact in that seed bed, um, because every seed gets that with the planter, but with the, or, yeah, with the planter, with the air drill, not necessarily. There's there's certainly a little more variability there. Could could uh, delivery also be a, a factor though with the, with the airstream delivery? Could we be cracking some seed and, and you know destroying germination that way that we're not aware of? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The planter should be fairly fairly gentle on seeds, right? Yeah, yeah. Other questions. Whenever I see all of the research results and all the trouble that comes with research trials, I remind myself of why you don't do it on the farm as much as you think you should. You know, you, th you always think, oh, I should run this, tr I, yeah, I, can, I can figure this out, I'll just run a, a quick uh, half a field one way, half a field another way. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily tell you all you need to know. I may have missed this earlier, but my question is, what is the geographical location or locations and or region or regions where these tests took place? Um, so the small plot trials, so that all the pulses and, and Durham that Ken had talked about, that's all southern Alberta. So we have, a, we have locations in Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, um, and then one in Brooks for the Durham. And then as far as the field scale canola trials, we had two here in southern Alberta, um, sort of within a half hour of Lethbridge, and then one was up in Oyen. Um, and that one, that one ended up getting uh, a, a lot of dry conditions, so it was really tough to, to evaluate that one. But, but most of the work has been here in southern Alberta. Thank you. Any thoughts to some meta-analysis? I suspect there's other work going on with planters in many locations. Anybody trying to Coalate it all, or is it more important to do it region by region? Do you think so that you have, uh, you know, what it's doing in a particular climatic zone? I, I, I think there's value to the to the regional approach. Um, like we've been kind of saying throughout the presentation, our, our results, even in our you know tight regional scope, uh, ha have actually been pretty pretty variable. Um, so we're getting a sense for how the planter performs. But again, every year, you know, every location is going to have some different factors that are going to change and might change as a producer, you know, what you would choose to use in a given year as well. Other questions for the guys? Anybody have any, any closing thoughts? Don't want to, I think this is great research. Could we have a round of applause for Ken and Lewis? Great work, you guys. We hope to hear more about this going forward. Excellent.